on behalf of the American Veterans Center, I'm uh, honored to be here to introduce tonight's honoree. Uh, for those of you new to the American Veterans Center, I'd like to offer a warm welcome. Uh, tonight's lecture is one of many projects throughout the year in which the ABC guards the legacy and honors the sacrifice of our military men and women of every generation. Uh, over the last two decades, the ABC has collected thousands of oral histories from American veterans from the First World War to the present day. Uh, we've produced dozens of radio and television documentary programs, including the recently completed Doolittle's Raiders, A Final Toast, uh, airing nationwide on public television this fall. Uh, and every Veterans Day weekend, we bring together hundreds of students from each of our nation's military academies and several dozen ROTC programs where they meet many of our nation's most distinguished veterans. Uh, at the ABC's annual conference, they're instilled with the uh, virtues of leadership while gaining a better appreciation for our military's heroes past and present. That same weekend, the ABC produces the honors, the first televised award show honoring our military uh, veterans and active duty. Uh, this Veterans Day television special airs on cable nationwide every fall. And as many of you may have recently seen, the ABC sponsors and produces the National Memorial Day Parade, held annually along Constitution Avenue here in Washington, which we brought back after a 70-year absence um, uh, from World War II. Uh, we revived it in, in uh, 2005. Uh, it's now the nation's largest Memori Memorial Day event, drawing some 300,000 spectators and a national television audience. Of our many programs, tonight's lecture is especially meaningful to us, honoring the memory of one of our great friends and mentors, General Andrew Goodpaster. It was conceived not only to honor his legacy, but to spotlight the work of fellow, fellow soldier scholars in his mold. Tonight's honoree most certainly fits that mold. He rose from PFC to Lieutenant Colonel over a 22-year Army career, where he largely served as a military intelligence officer. Uh, this career left him well suited for a second career as a writer and strategic thinker, publishing numerous essays in military journals such as Parameters and Military Review. He has also written for USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, The New York Post, among many other newspapers, and regularly appears on the Fox News Channel. In addition to several nonfiction works, he also has the distinction of being the first Good Pastor Prize recipient to be a noted novelist. His latest work, Valley of the Shadow, is the latest in his acclaimed series on the Civil War. And his remarks tonight will draw from, uh, from this work. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce one of our nation's preeminent soldier scholars and recipient of the 2015 Andrew Jackson Good Pastor Prize, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters. You're a lucky audience. It is thundering and thumping down rain outside, so you, t <laughs> you timed it really well. I am so grateful for the award, uh, so much so that I won't belabor the point. Um, when I was at, working on my master's degree, I wrote a th uh, thesis on NATO's early formative decades. And of course, General Goodpaster had a very important role to play in that. I wish I could remember what I wrote. <laughs> it's, it's been a while. But I am honored and I thank you. Now, if I were a true Washingtonian, what I would do would be to begin by delivering carefully crafted, wonderfully humble remarks telling you how great I am. But, but since I'm not a good Washingtonian, rather I want to talk about leadership. And so although most of the, the characters I will discuss are drawn from the current book, Valley of the Shadow, I'll draw from other books and other research. And I'm, I'm calling this the Civil War and the Mysteries of Leadership. Because at the end of the day, at the end of many a long day throughout history, leadership at its highest level remains a mystery. When I was a lieutenant, a second lieutenant, a first lieutenant, I, I, I dutifully read all the great military books I could get my hands on. And I was looking for the answer. You know, how do you be a great leader? And you get a lot of valuable information along the way. And the military studies how to turn out leaders. And you can checklist certain things, integrity, sense of duty, you know, care for the troops. But beyond the checklists, beyond the manuals, beyond the helpful hints in memoirs, there still is this great mystery. And leadership is not ultimately formulaic. Leadership comes in many, many varieties. I'm always astonished 
even limiting it to the Civil War alone, by the remarkable cast of leaders and the great, great variety. And so what I'd like to do tonight is to, to give you some snapshots, some oral snapshots of some of the men who particularly intrigued me. And some are professional soldiers, some are not. But they all did their best, north and south, to serve their country to the best of their abilities. And at times, their achievements were, and their courage, their, their ability to galvanize soldiers to incredible acts of valor, again, still remains a mystery. And I'll start with um, someone who really is, should be the patron saint of soldiers who write books. And that is Volunteer General Lew Wallace, the forgotten man who served Washington. Now, can anybody tell me anything about Lew Wallace out there? He wrote ben good, very good. He wrote Ben Hur. And Lew Wallace um, was an Indiana man, a politician, would be soldier. He served in, in, the Tex in Texas and northern Mexico briefly in the Mexican War, part of the local militia out in Indiana. And when the war came, he was actually much better prepared than many of the other men who had become political generals, as they were called. Well, Lew Wallace was very dutiful, strong, strong sense of duty to the country, believed in the Union. He wasn't a West Pointer. That was one strike against him in the West, because General Henry Halleck, before he came East, Halleck was called Old Brains. That was his nickname. And he, he actually said, and I'm paraphrasing, that volunteer generals were no better than criminals. He felt that if you weren't a West Pointer, uh, you simply couldn't do it. Well, the interesting thing about Lew Wallace is he did do it. At Fort Donelson, Grant's first really important victory, Grant's on the river when the Confederates launched their attack, their sally from the fort. Grant's talking to the, the, the naval commander uh, on the, on the um, the river end, Lou Wallace is under orders to stay where he is and not move. Well, Lou Wallace sees that the Union line to his right is collapsing, and he disobeys orders and attacks and saves the day Fort Donaldson Falls. Fast forward to Shiloh a few months later. At Shiloh, Lou Wallace tries very hard to obey his orders to the letter, but they're very vague orders, the situation overtakes the orders, and Shiloh is such a near-run thing. The first day is such a disaster that they need a scapegoat. And really, as much as I admire Grant and Sherman, the first day at Shiloh was not their finest hour. Now, they fought hard and they pulled through, but they let their guard down, made false assumptions. The army was not prepared. Lew Wallace, who's several miles distant, gets an order to march, but the route he's told to take is the wrong route. He does his best. He gets there by the evening. Well, Henry Halleck is the Grand Wazoo in the West at this point, and he decides that everything that happened went wrong was Lew Wallace's sake for, and fault. So Lew Wallace is sent back, packing back to Indiana. Uh, he's cooling his heels. He wants to be back in the fight. Uh, during Morgan's raid, he actually saves the city of Cincinnati in neighboring Ohio. He still can't get back in. Finally, his supporters, and there's politics on all sides of this, his supporters do get Lew Wallace reinstated in active service in, in a military district centered on Baltimore, hardly the front lines. Wallace has no troops under his command except some invalids, some guards, some rotating militia. He, he, he does his best. His number one duty at first is to make sure the elections run smoothly. He does that all right. Well, then in the summer, early summer of 1864, Something happens, and all the intelligence services of the Union Army, all the intelligence work in Washington, all the information gatherers totally miss, jubile early, and between 16 and 20,000 Confederates storming up the Valley of Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley, into Maryland and toward Washington. They're on a raid. They're going to take Washington. And Grant is convinced nobody, and, and I admire Grant, but we all have our faults. He's convinced nobody has left these lines. He's pinned them all down. Um, and he keeps getting these reports and dismissing them. The only person getting good intelligence is the head of the B&O Railroad, headquartered in Baltimore. 
and he takes the reports from his station master, who's saying hey, the Confederates are here in strength, they're tearing up tracks, takes them to Lew Wallace. And Lew Wallace believes them. He's the only guy north of the Potomac that believes any of this. Washington keeps poo-pooing the rumors that Early's coming. Early is nearly to Frederick. Lew Wallace, on his own initiative, and his, his, his western boundary is the Minoxi River, which flows, of course, just south of Frederick. Lew Wallace gathers up what we call the clerks and jerks, invalids, some, merli uh, some militias, and he, he gets a, a, between two and 3,000 raw recruits and, and militiamen out there at Frederick. He gets a battery of artillery, uh, really only two functional guns in the key part of the battle, um, and finally he gets some regular cavalry who are kind of passing through and he grabs them. And Early is leading combat veterans of the Army of Northern Virginia. And Lew Wallace is determined to make a stand. Because he knows now everything's about time. And he's on the Minoxi. He's got his advance guard, as it were, west of Frederick, trying to delay an entire army marching as hard as they can for Frederick and then Washington. He's not sure if they're going to Baltimore or Washington. He bets on Washington. And finally, Washington wakes up. Grant wakes up. They start rushing forces, um, the elements of the Sixth Corps, up to Annapolis and to Washington, but they're running late. It's close. The night, just the day before, Early is about to hit his, uh, Wallace's main position, brilliantly and beautifully chosen on the south bank of the Monoxy River. Regiments start arriving. He gets about two-thirds of Jim Ricketts' division from the Sixth Corps which brings him up to a total of under 6,000 men, half of whom are, again, green recruits. You got about 16,000 Confederates at this point because they're peeling some off. And early, just ex he's heard there's just nothing out there but militia. He thinks he'll storm over them. Lou Wallace and another forgotten man, Jim Ricketts, James Ricketts, multiple wounds, uh, a very, very brave general. He's not handsome. He, he's, not a, he's not the kind of guy that electrifies the media. Um, and they make this stand on the monocacy. It's, it's, it's dramatized in the book, but it's incredible what they do. With brilliant tactics, finely chosen terrain. They hold early off, early from early in the morning to late afternoon when finally they're enveloped, they're collapsing. And Wallace gives Ricketts a chance to rescue his division and, and get them out of there in mid-afternoon. And Ricketts won't do it. They stay and they fight, take tremendous casualties, but they buy a day. As a result of that kind of leadership, Lou Wallace, you know, who's out of favor, taking risks, daring, doing what has to be done, Jim Ricketts, Wallace has no authority over him when his troops start arriving by train. They're supposed to go to Harper's Ferry, which would have taken them out of the battle and out of Early's path. Jim Ricketts on his own decides, no, the fight is here, I'll stay. They're risking court martials and worse, but they save the Union. When the Confederates finally, in, in terribly hot weather, on forced marches, two days later, they, were the, they literally get within sight of the newly completed Capitol Dome. And within the same hour that the Confederate skirmishers are approaching the Washington defenses, the Sixth Corps is marching up 7th Street and filling into the forts. Within one hour, had they not made that stand, on the monocacy, virtually forgotten today, Early would have seized Washington and burned it and left, so Washington would have been burned twice. Now, what's the leadership lesson of that? Well, obviously, there are many lessons. You can draw them yourselves. But sometimes that personal moral courage to do what you believe is right, even though that you know there will be penalties, and there were penalties, that's critical. Now, Lew Wallace, the thanks he gets Henry Halleck persuades everyone that his stand on the monocacy wasted lives was a debacle and Wallace is fired in disgrace. Now, when Jim Ricketts, Ricketts and others start telling the story, he's finally uh, reinstated um, in, at his rank, et cetera, but he's never given a combat command again because the Indiana politics, Lincoln needs Indiana. They don't want uh, they do not want Lew Wallace to be a successful politician after the war, so he, he can't be given a command. It was even more political then than it is now. But there's a, there's a coda. 
Grant makes him governor of the New Mexico territories after the war, because Grant knows what he did. And in the cr then crumbling Palace of the Governors in Santa Fe, he completes Ben-Hur while dealing with Billy the Kid in the Lincoln County Range War. Well, that all sounds like enough for one career. Later, he's appointed our, the equivalent of an ambassador, we didn't call them ambassadors then, to the Sublime Port, the Sultan's Court in Constantinople, or Istanbul. Well, Lou Wallace, being Lou Wallace and a proud Hoosier and a Midwestern guy, gets to the court, which is over-regulated to say the least. Um, and at the first encounter with the Sultan, the first audience, he just walks out and sticks out his hand. And the Sultan is like, what the, you know, whiskey tango foxtrot. And, <laughs> but he takes Lou Wallace's hand, and Lou Wallace becomes his first Western advisor and the Sultan, they're, they're as close to being friends as you can be in the circumstances. When the presidential administrations change back in the States, and Wallace is recalled because the spoil system was very active, the Sultan personally sends a letter to the American president saying, how can a mere change of presidents rob me of my friend Lou Wallace? So Lou Wallace, after that, goes back, starts a writer's renaissance in Indiana, and does public service to the end of his days, a great leader. That's a little more than you needed about Lou Wallace, but I'm fascinated by these have forgotten and forgotten figures. And then moved to the Shenandoah Valley in 1864. Now, one thing I worry about today's army and military is the political correctness to the point where I, you, you dare not speak. Well, that wouldn't have washed in the Civil War because as some of you may have heard me say in the past, you know, we romanticize the Civil War. We put them up on pedestals and everybody's clean and heroic and fine and they speak, everybody speaks like a Victorian parson. They didn't. In the Shenandoah Valley con uh, confrontation between Early and Phil Sheridan in the, the late summer and early autumn of 1864, many lives could have been saved if these armies had just lined up and Phil Sheridan and Jubal Early had walked out in front of the armies and had a cursing contest. They were flamboyantly, imaginatively obscene, profane, call it what you will. And the men loved it. Uh, they just did. And the, the curious thing is both of these men serve leaders who really don't use obscenity. Robert E. Lee absolutely is obsessed with the ideals of being a, basically a, a Regency era gentleman uh, in, the, in British terms. And he's locked, his code is locked in the 1820s and 1830s. His speech patterns are, Lee, you, you dare not curse around Lee. You just don't do it. Well, Early gets away with it. Harry Heath can get away with it. And then Grant, Grant doesn't use obscenity. Once in a while, he'll say, damn. He doesn't. But he's, he's amused by people who do, like his, his key aide, John Rawlins, and Sheridan. He loves Sheridan. And Sheridan will go off in these wild Irish madcap tirades. And, and Grant just sort of sits there smiling and laughing. Well, the lesson of this is not that you have to curse like a my old drill sergeant, to be a successful leader. But it's that leaders come in many forms. You get the incredibly inspirational Robert E. Lee, who is a rigid gentleman. And you get Jubal Early. Now, Jubal Early, he, like so many of the Confederate generals who performed well, Lee, Early, Wade Hampton, he was strongly opposed to secession. He went to the Virginia Convention, made speeches against it, fought against it, but like the, and as Wade Hampton opposed secession in, in, in the Carolinas. And when their states seceded, they went with their states. But Early, Early's a crotchety guy. From the Mexican War, he got rheumatism. He's, bent, he's big, but he's bent over. He has a beard that's always stained with tobacco juice. Uh, really ugly. He's fathered several illegitimate children by a poor white woman he keeps in a hill up, for, uh, up above his hometown back in Rocky Point, Virginia. Um, he's not a clean living man, but he's a fighter. Now here's the interesting thing about Early. Early is not charismatic. He doesn't really inspire troops, but he leads, he leads he's, a, he's a good leader, and the troops initially at least trust him to make the right decisions. Now Early gets a bad rap, but Jubal Early, when you look at what he did, he is always, always outnumbered by Sheridan at least two to three to one, sometimes three to four to one. Lee never fires early, despite the fact that the Richmond papers keep attacking him because he keeps losing. But Lee knows that there's nobody better, nobody else could do better. 
Now, Phil shared, an, while they, they share a taste for colorful language, as they called it at the time, Phil Sheridan's his opposite. Phil Sheridan is a runny little Irishman with a funny shaped head. That's why he always wears that sort of flattened pork pie hat. It's the only hat that'll really fit him and, and, and look decent. Um, he, he has a huge torso, short legs, long arms. Even Lincoln makes fun of him. And, uh, and, and, but Sheridan has the magic. Soldiers just respond to him. They love him. He can rally troops um, just by riding by. And that's one of the things that's always fascinated me. You know, you do in your military careers meet some people who are absolutely charismatic. Now, I take uh, uh, the current or uh, recent generation of generals, you know, Marine General Jim Mattis. Jim, he's better looking than Chesty Puller was, but he's not going to win a beauty contest. <laughs> but he's like Sheridan. He could just, troops loved him. They, you know, they, he inspired the troops. And Sheridan, while Early does the best he can, Sheridan keeps making mistakes. He's rescued at Third Winchester, Opeckin Creek, by his subordinates. Uh, the best, the General Crook, um, one of his subordinates, who, he'll, who Sheridan in his later years will, de will betray his old friend Crook, claiming Sheridan wants to claim credit for every single uh, decision himself. Crook saves him at Third Winchester, and then Crook comes up with a plan for Fisher's Hill, the flank on the mountain, uh, mountainside. But, but Sheridan is, a, is very much a classic, not a political general, he's a, but he's a, a general who's a politician. And with Sheridan, he takes good care of his subordinates during the war and for years afterwards. He's ruthless in cutting down his peers. And he's slavish in his subservience to Grant. He knows where his bread is buttered. He's not really an attractive figure as an individual. Um, he's somewhat duplicitous, but he's incredibly brave and soldiers love him. And jumping ahead to the climactic battle of the Valley Campaign at Cedar Creek, early, advised by uh, John Brown Gordon, who I may get, have time to get to, uh, stages one of the great surprise attacks in all of military history. Wildly outnumbered, outgunned, tired, unfed, Early's troops, with, with Gordon, John Brown Gordon, leading the flank attack, they just run over two Union Corps, are in the process of destroying a third, the Veteran Six Corps. Only the Vermont Brigade stand, and really one division, uh, making a stand right by Middletown, saves some of the Army. Sheridan's just coming back from Washington. He's in Winchester. It's, he's about 15 miles from the battle, battle, uh, the battle scene. And he gets up, he hears the guns, he doesn't know what it is at first, he knows there's supposed to be a, 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 a reconnaissance of force by his people. But when he starts riding south and getting reports, suddenly he sees there are soldiers that have run for miles. The army is fleeing, it's disintegrated. And Sheridan, on his huge, um, this wonderful horse he has, and I'm blanking out on the name, I'm sure you all remember it, a Rienzi, named after the Wagner's opera. And Rienzi, he, he, he has this big torso, he's impressive on horseback. He just starts riding south with his staff trying to keep up. And he's giving orders as he goes along and rallying men. And this, this army, his army of the valley, it has yeah. been defeated, it has been crushed. They're just trying to survive. And the cavalry, by the way, helps cover what they, everybody thinks is going to be a retreat. Sheridan gets, he rallies people, gets to the battlefield. Someone turns to him and says, we believe we can do an orderly, orderly withdrawal. And she says, we're not going anywhere. And he starts riding by the troops who are reforming and their officers are trying to gather them in. And he said, men, we're going to sleep in the same tents and the same grounds we, we slept in last night. And he takes his time across several hours, gets the intelligence right, has the cavalry do the scouting that has to be done. And this broken army, just not even a half dozen hours after it has been utterly defeated, ran in terror, just fled. They turn around and they defeat a crushing defeat on Early's army. Now, there are various tactical reasons for it, but it's stunning what this man can do. So you have inspirational leadership. Lou Wallace and Jim Ricketts are not inspirational leaders. They're men with the courage to do the right thing. You get Sheridan, who's an inspirational leader, doesn't, in my view, doesn't have nearly the ethical fiber of Lou Wallace, 
um, or Jim Ricketts, who will always, always to the end of his days, regret his part in the Fitz John Porter's court martial. But again, they come in many flavors. They all share a sense of duty. But what are the limits of duty? Now, this is something with I'm writing a book now on the Petersburg front, the crater and Ream Station, Globe Tavern, Deep Bottom. It'll be a follow on to this book in the summer and early autumn on the, on the Petersburg Richmond front in 1864. And there's some fascinating characters in that, that that give you, raise other questions, even if they don't give you the answers. One was, where does duty stop? Now, those of you who served, you know, I served from the 70s into the 90s, and those of you who served even earlier know, in the Army and Marines, and I suspect the other services, you're supposed to just stand to your post, whatever. You know, no matter how sick you are, no matter how tired, you're supposed to be able to stay awake for two weeks running and make good decisions all the while. And, and human beings do have limits. So you have Francis Channing Barlow. Now, Francis Channing Barlow was a Harvard class of 1855 valedictorian. Brilliant man from uh, old New England bloodlines on both sides. However, his father is a, is, a, is a preacher who basically goes mad, goes totally off the reservation, uh, leaves his mother. His mother's a famous beauty, and he, he, he grows up in genteel poverty that's not always genteel. He lives on a commune at Brook Farm for a while. Some of you may know about the, the whole Concord movement. And he, he's a brilliant man, Barlow. He's quirky. He's strange. Uh, he's the kind of guy that really, kind of never really gains close friends. You can't get that close to Barlow. But he's incredibly brave. He's as close to fearless, uh, which is almost a, to the, almost the point of a mental disorder, as you can. Though he volunteers early on as a private, of course, rises rapidly through the army ranks, through the volunteer ranks. He's repeatedly badly wounded. At Gettysburg, he's wounded, captured by the Confederates. He's left behind uh, because they assume he's going to die. By early 1864, he's back leading a division uh, in the Army of the Potomac. And Barlow, he learns fast. At Gettysburg, where there's, there is a monument to, Gar uh, to Barlow at Gettysburg, his worst day of the war, when he made a terrible mistake and un uncovered the, um, the right wing of the 11th Corps. And it, was, it turns into a disaster. But everybody keeps him in the army because they know he's a fighter. And he's a guy who breaks uh, Lee's lines at the mule shoe at Spotsylvania. He's just incredibly brave. But he's, and here's the key thing about these generals. When you read the history books about him, you say, well, why did they do this or that? They were almost all of them suffering from multiple wounds. It was rare for general officers not to have been wounded at least once or twice. The big killer in the Civil War, as many of you know, is dysentery, aggravated diarrhea. Now, this is in the days before aspirin. These men are suffering from wounds. Uh, the, you know, a, a, a guy I love, a Confederate lieutenant colonel and colonel, uh, William C. Oates, 15th Alabama, he's leading his troops into battle with, with a shot up hip, and he's just limping along, leading them with a sword. But Barlow, uh, by the midsummer, by July, he is truly ill with dysentery. He's got what, what clearly was a, a bad foot infection. Um, he's got intermittent toothache. His wounds are bothering him terribly. And he's sicker and sicker. He's getting the heat in August, in July and August, is always bad in Tidewater, Virginia. That year was really, really hot. But Barlow, and he's sick. He's getting, people are starting to hint, you're too sick to lead. You really should recover. He won't quit. He sees his duty to be there. And oh, by the way, on the battlefield of the first deep bottom, he learns that his wife has just died of typhus. She was nursing soldiers to be by her husband. And so it's actually quite a touching love story, but don't have time for that. So Barlow sticks, it really is a, mo a moving one. And Barlow will later, after the war, go on to marry Ellen Gould Shaw, a sister of Robert Gould Shaw, who led the 54th Massachusetts at Battery Wagner. You've seen the film Glory. Now, the story on Bob Wagner, uh, or, sorry, uh, Bob Shaw, is that Barlow tutored him through Harvard. He wasn't very bright. He wasn't particularly an abolitionist, but his mother was a dragon lady, and she was ferociously abolitionist, and she basically forces Robert Gould Shaw to take command of the 54th Massachusetts. Not exactly like the film. But Barlow, so all these New England families all volunteer. Uh, a Lowell is going to die. 
on the battlefield at Cedar Creek. I mean, the, all these names that are associated with early American history, they're volunteers. But Barlow, Francis Channing Barlow, he takes a leave, buries his wife, comes back, and he is sick, and he, he, he doesn't know when to quit. You've got to know when to quit. And he doesn't, as a result of Second Deep Bottom, Hancock, Winfield Scott Hancock, the Corps commander, commanding the entire wing of the army now, he's grooming Barlow to take over the Corps because Hancock knows he's so sick from his wounds, he's going to have to leave. Well, Barlow botches it terribly. He sends in his forces piecemeal. He does everything he's, he's torn other officers apart from doing. And finally, he, he, has to, he, collapse, he virtually collapses. He goes back to the hospital at City Point. Should be the end of the story. This man is truly, truly ill. And about five days later, he pops back up to retake command of his division at Ream Station. And it's, the Confederates are ready to attack. Barlow collapses again. This time he has to be carried off. He's done. But he did real harm because he was trying to do his duty beyond the limits of common sense. So again, all these questions come up. For me personally, what are the limits of duty? Um, his subordinate, Nelson Miles, who go on to be a great Indian fighter, takes over the division from Bar uh, uh, um, Barlow. Now, Nelson Miles was a, a clerk in a co crockery store in Boston who fantasized about military glory. Before the war, he joins a militia. He takes lessons in drill from a, a, a dubious French colonel. Um, he'll do anything. And he gets the war. Nelson Miles is one of those people who's a natural soldier. And he does tremendously well, and he's a protege of Frank Barlow, Francis Channing Barlow, all the way up. But then he, he tries to hint that Barlow needs to get off stage, he's too sick, but you can only go so far. And, and Nelson Miles is dealing with the issues of, well, where does loyalty go? Does it go to Frank Barlow, who's moved me up to be a 24-year-old brigadier general? And by the way, in the Civil War, the problem wasn't the young generals, it was the old generals. Uh, they had to make this transition to modern warfare. But Nelson Miles, is a loyalty to the troops? Is it to the mission? Whenever I encounter books on leadership, they don't ask those hard questions. You know, where is the ultimate loyalty? To the cause, to the flag, to your friend, to your soldiers, to the mission of the day, which might be a stupid mission? I don't have the answers to these, but history at least gives us some, some background to begin to ask the right questions. And then you have people back to the Shenandoah Valley. John Brown Gordon, just a, a wonderful, wonderful Georgian, who is the kind of guy I've always said, he's the kind of guy that will entertain anybody, everybody at the dinner table but will never pick up the check. He's, a, he's incredibly charming, a cavalier, has a great love story with his wife who follows him all over the war. Um, his wife, at, 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 when the Confederate Army, Early's Army is collapsing at 3rd Winchester, she's out in the streets of Winchester telling those soldiers to get back in line and General Gordon's going to be after them if they don't. And um, uh, General Gordon is another of those guys who's naturally charismatic. Just charming, tall, handsome, and he is also a fine, fine soldier. But his problem is he's not you know, he and Early just don't get along because Early's this bent over guy with a stained beard and Gordon's is just this dashing George Clooney type of guy and Early just plain resents it. So what do you do with a situation like that? Well, what Gordon does is he soldiers on, but the, the tension is always there. And the tension between Gordon and Early, who could have been a brilliant team, the tension badly hurts the Confederate cause. Well, then what do you do with the sociopaths and psychopaths? Another boy general, George Armstrong Custer. Uh, in, in the war, you know, he's a, in his early 20s, he's a brigadier general, jumped from captain to general, to brigadier general, by, um, just on the eve of the Battle of Gettysburg. Custer loves war. He loves war. I mean, he loves to get out there with a saber and fight and kill people. And there are a number of cavalrymen like that. Uh, but Custer, he, he's a brilliant, brilliant soldier, but he has to be controlled. And Phil Sheridan is the one guy who can control him and use him well. And Custer worries during the war that after the war, you know, he'll be forgotten. That nothing will, you know, he, out in the West, he's going to go back to the plains. He knows that if he's going to stay in the Army. But the, the curious thing about the Little Bighorn 
is Custer was trying to do exactly what worked out for him on one Civil War battlefield after another. His favorite technique was to split his forces, fix the enemy, and have the, uh, the other part of his force envelop them. It just didn't work out out in the Dakota territories. But, but again, you know, uh, you know, there's so many of these people who wouldn't work in today's military. You know, Custer is not the kind of guy you want in peacetime. You know, he narrowly, narrowly avoids after the war getting kicked out of the service because he decides to take the 7th Cavalry on a several hundred mile trek to visit his wife, who he misses. Now, you're probably not supposed to do that. But nonetheless, in wartime, you need these guys who are killers, who are ruthless killers. And we want everybody to be polite all the time. That does also concern me. So let me get to the opposite of Custer. Another guy who you might know in a different context, Rudd Hayes. Rudd Hayes, early middle age, Ohio man. And there were actually mafias in these armies, sort of political groupings. For, in Lee's army of uh, Northern Virginia is really hampered by the fact that Lee can't help himself. He shows favoritism toward Virginians. Virginians run that army. Everybody else will be second tier. All the intimates, Lee's intimates, are all Virginians. And the Alabamans recognize it. And the Georgians recognize it. The Carolinians recognize, Linians recognize it. Now, in the North, it's a little different. It's not that exclusive, but there's our old boys club. Uh, George Gordon Meade, Andrew Atkinson Humphreys, his chief of staff later, corps commander, brilliant, brilliant soldier. Uh, they're from Philadelphia. Winfield Scott Hancock's from Norristown, just outside of Philadelphia. There are a whole bunch of other Philadelphians in it. Then there's this Ohio political mafia uh, that's going to include Rudd Hayes, also known as Rutherford B. Hayes, and his protege, William McKinley. Now, as soon as I say political mafias, you get the idea of, well, the spoils system, Tammany Hall, that. The fact, Rutherford B. Hayes may have been the most ethical senior politician in American history. But first, he fights in the Civil War. And Rudd Hayes is a colonel, commanding a brigade, then a division. Later, he'll be promoted to general near the war's end. But he always said he didn't care about rank. He just wanted to be one of the good colonels who fought the war. And Rudd Hayes, unlike Custer, Rudd Hayes hates war. I mean, he just hates it. But he does his duty. He's a very literate man, well-educated, uh, adores his wife, wants to be back with his family. Uh, one of his children dies. Many of these generals have children die during the war. It really hurts Longstreet's performance. Uh, personal lives do matter. But anyway, Rudd Hayes, um, brigade commander on the field of 3rd Winchester. And he's ordered forward. The day is not going well for Sheridan, even though Sheridan had surprise. He wouldn't listen to Crook, wouldn't listen to anybody. He pig-headed, bull-headed guy. And um, Rudd Hayes is on this flanking mission. And it's, the day is close. The Confederates you know, are doing a tremendously powerful defense, although they're, they're getting the noose is closing around them. But it still can go either way. Well, Rudd Hayes is told, to, you know, he crosses streams, he crosses little streams, swing to the west, and recross the stream into the Confederate depths of the Confederate flank. Well, nobody knows the ground. He's never seen it before. And he does what he's told. And it turns out that little creek where he's crossing, ordered to cross, is a swamp. And the, the, lower, the southern bank is high, and Confederates are on it. And before they know it's, his, his brigade is just tumbling down into this ravine, into this swamp. He's, he, his horse gets mired in mud. He has to jump down in the mud. He, he can't get his boots out of the mud. His soldiers are being shot down for, by the Confederates who are having a high old time uh, shooting them from the bank. They're dying all around him, his Indiana men, his West Virginia regiments. And the sensible military thing would have been to pull back. It looked like he couldn't win. His men are being slaughtered. Well, he wasn't a professional military man. He didn't know the rules. And he has this moment of doubt, clearly, where he has to decide what to do. And then he, we don't know what his exact words were, but it's basically, follow me. And Rudd Hayes, this colonel, st starts tromping through the mud for the far bank, pistol up, trying to keep the powder dry. And he is loved by his soldiers because his soldiers know he's always taking care of them. He's a truly caring, decent man. And the soldiers aren't going to let Hayes go alone. And it's one of the most inspirational moments I have seen in the Civil War, where out of this swamp, these Union soldiers, oh, they're all mixed together. They're bleeding. They're drowning in, in the water when they're wounded. They 
rally around them and they st start to make it onto the muddy uh, the far bank and they're clawing their way up and more and more men are joining him and he doesn't have time to reorder the regiment it's just follow me again and up the bank right into the confederates and they drive them back and more men start making it across and rudd hayes they get up on the high ground there's a battery there it's swinging its guns to kill it's charge and rudd hayes leads this a virtual mob of his men who will follow him anywhere, turns a Confederate flank, pushes forward. Uh, he's exhausted. He's psychically drained. His, his brigade, he's got at most half of it with him, come up against a strong Confederate defense. He's wondering what to do. He thinks, this is as far as I can go. Then he gets the word that the division commander is down. He's now the division commander. He doesn't even know where the division is. But he starts finding out. And he, you know, he, again, he rallies, his men will do anything for this guy. And he manages to get that division moving. And as the Confederate lines collapse, Rutherford B. Hayes, is the f his brigade, his, his old regiment, is the first regiment to reach the Winchester Courthouse. And an apocryphal story says, as one of his soldiers said to him, after this, Colonel, you're going to be governor. <laughs> Well, Hayes, you know, and he's also, by the way, suffering. He's really allergic to poison ivy. He spent much of the war in West Virginia in the brambles. But Hayes, at his, he does what the Confederates, who are tough, the toughest, the toughest infantry I've ever seen are the guys in the Army in Northern Virginia. Uh, but the Confederates think at Fisher's Hill, they're, they're protected by the river on one side, a uh, steep mountain on the other. And um, Crook's guys and Hayes division, especially, they're called the Mountain Creepers from West Virginia. And Hayes sort of looks at that mountain and thinks, we can do that. Crook wants to know, can you get around that mountain? He says, yeah, we can do that. And Hay Crook has two divisions in his corps. It's a small corps. And they both decide they can go around the mountain. Everybody's skeptical. The other corps commanders mock him. Sheridan's unsure. But Sheridan will take a risk. So Hayes leads his troops, Indian file, uh, across the side of a stony mountain, gets in behind the Confederates again, Fisher's Hill, deals him another great defeat. Now, he doesn't have a good, as good a day uh, at uh, Cedar Creek, where his division is overrun, but he does his best he fights. But anyway, he's a different kind of leader. He's a man who leads with ethics and honesty. John Gordon, John Gordon, you get this, he'll do anything to get ahead. He's going to go on to a distinguished career as governor or senator. Brilliant soldier, incredibly brave man, not terribly scrupulous. But they work. All these different styles of leadership work. Now, one thing they do have is they all lead from the front. A little different in the Union Army, though, because they lead from the front to a point. Division commanders don't lead charges. The Confederates, in love with the Walter, novels of Walter Scott, generals lead from the front. And as a result, Lee runs out of generals, although some good ones come up later in the war, uh, such as Billy Mahone, this guy who's about five foot four, uh, an engineer, a railroad engineer before the war, dyspeptic. He, Billy Mahone loves fancy uniforms. He travels with a cow, chickens, and a pastry cook. <laughs> but he turns, he's the most ferocious f division commander Lee has in the last year of the war, the man who turns a tide at the crater. And the crater's another story. Uh, very rarely told. It's, it's one of the ugliest racial massacres in American history with the massacres on both sides. Black troops, who remember the slaughter at Fort Pillow, initially show no quarter to the Confederates. The Confederates counterattack, show no quarter to the black troops. It is an ugly, ugly day, at the end of which, and you probably heard, haven't heard this, the Union troops trapped in the crater, some of them turn on their fellow Union troops, who happen to be US colored troops, and shoot them, or bayonet the black troops wearing the same uniform, so that, because they hope the Confederates won't kill them. Now, one, can, one incident happens where a Union officer actually shoots a black soldier to show that he doesn't like black troops. The Confederates are so horrified by his treachery that they shoot him. Point of justice. But anyway, Rudd Hayes, I want to get back just briefly to Rudd Hayes. I'm diverting myself because it's so rich in all these characters. Rudd Hayes, after the war, um, Rudd Hayes, of course, becomes president in the disputed election of, of 1876, the original hanging chat election in which Frank Barlow plays an interesting part. But Rutherford B. Hayes had promised when he ran, he said, I will serve one, if elected, I will serve one term. Well, Rudd Hayes is the first president to try to reform the civil service. 
He's got to make compromises, basically ending Reconstruction, because that's how they can decide the election. But he dedicates much of the rest of his life to education uh, for blacks and for, for legal protections for them. Uh, he refuses to intervene on the side of the, the uh, ownership and the, the great strike of 1878 until the strikers start to destroying property. By the time he leaves, uh, he's ready to leave office and ready for the next election, he is absolutely loved by the American people. I mean, we don't think of Rutherford B. Hayes now unless it's a punchline and a late night joke. He was loved. He was a good, good president who only made one great mistake, and I'll get to that in a moment. But he could have easily been reelected. But here's, and this is a politician most of his life. He says, no, I told the American people I would run, serve one term, I'm going home. And he went home. He dedicated the rest of his life to education for uh, blacks, for poor whites, and his, the highlight of his life was he'd hold reunions for his soldiers on his, his, his small farm. And they all came to the end of his days. And the soldiers really loved that man. Now, the, Frank Barlow, another man who's quirky. Barlow is a kill, merciless killer, but he has high ethics. And after the war, he goes back to New York. He's a lawyer. Uh, he's elected to various offices. He's Solicitor General of the State of New York, if I recall correctly. Uh, might have the title just off. Fights the tweet, the Tammany Hall, the Tweed Ring, and the Repu he's a Republican. And the Republicans figure, well, okay, he's our man. The disputed election of 1876 comes down to Louis basically Louisiana and Florida. There are questions in other states. Well, the Republicans pull Frank Barlow to check on the ballots on one of the counties, one of the key counties in Florida, one of the disputed counties, and they're figuring, well, he's one of us. Well, Barlow comes back saying, no, the Democrats won this county end of Barlow's political career. But he does go on to have a decent and successful life uh, as an attorney. Well, anyway, again, what I'm trying to convey with some, hopefully some colorful stories that might interest you a little bit, is that first of all, these men in the Civil War weren't, there weren't bronze statues on marble pillars. They were real men with real clerks, quirks, with, with tremendous complexity. Some of them are like Rudd Hayes, they're afraid, but they, do their duty and perform incredible acts of heroism. Others like Custer seem to feel no fear. That he's virtually psychotic. Uh, you have some uh, like Robert E. Lee, who's obsessed with being a gentleman and can't see beyond Virginia. You have a man like Grant, who's failed at everything in his previous life, but has a genius for war. And even Grant's, Grant's own subordinates don't get him. Sherman doesn't get him at first. Sherman has to learn. But Grant's the guy, the first guy in any army that I can find, European, uh, uh, North America, South America, he's the first guy to realize what modern war takes. The model, even for very fine generals, and, and George Gordon Meade's tremendously uh, underrated. He won the Battle of Gettysburg against Robert E. Lee. But the model for all these generals on both sides is a Napoleonic or a Frederician model, where you march out, you fight a battle, uh, somebody wins, somebody loses, and both you go back to your corners and lick your wounds and replenish. And then a while later, you go out and fight another battle or have another campaign. And Grant's insight is that war has to be constant. In modern war, you must grind the enemy down. And yes, there is attrition. But as a percentage of forces engaged, Lee's losses are consistently higher than Grant's except at Cole Harbor. Grant knows what it takes to win. He's also the first general who divorces himself from the battlefield. He only occasionally goes forward to see the fighting. He doesn't want to see the wounded. He hates hospitals because he knows he can't let it. He, he's, he's actually a tender-hearted man. He can't stand cruelty to animals. He needs his beef cooked black. He can't ha handle if there's any blood in it. He, he, doesn't, he knows his conscience will get the better of him if he goes forward, and he doesn't. And he knows the most merciful thing is to win the war. And the one man in the North who gets it isn't in uniform. It's Abraham Lincoln, which is another breed of leadership entirely. So the point of this short, in, hopefully, hopelessly, I cannot speak, hopelessly inadequate talk this evening uh, was to try to give you a feel for the variety of leadership then. And I suspect were we ever, God forbid, to have to fight a major war today, we would see a wide variety of leaders emerge after the great peacetime leaders were swept aside. But the Civil War, I'm fascinated by it because it formed the America we know. 
we're still dealing with its reverberations as we recently saw or see now in some of the southern states. Um, 150 years later, it, history has very long curves. It's a war worth studying, certainly for exercises in command, to understand your history, and to consider the fact that you'll hear people saying, well, our country's never been so divided. 750,000 Americans died in our Civil War. I'd say we were slightly more divided then. So at any rate, these people were real flesh and blood human beings with lust, with passion, with hunger for power, with fear, uh, with head lice, with dysentery. What's amazing about them, when you get up beyond the little lines in the maps and history books, is how much they transcended pain and fear to fight the war that decided we would be one nation under God, indivisible. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Microphone is coming to you. Yeah, the naval commander has to be able to swim. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, you know, I, I really can't because I'm writing about the Army. It's not to neglect the Navy, but you know, I, that's what I know. I'm a you know, I'm boots on the ground kind of guy. But what strikes me about the, uh, the Navy in the Civil War, uh, its most important operations, other than the blockade, are riverine operations. It's a, it's a brown water Navy to a great extent. And the, the joint operations in the West uh, between with Porter and Grant, their cooperation is just a model for joint action. It's, it's really, really impressive. Um, Farragut, of course, Farragut is in the, just the great naval tradition of damn the torpedoes and full speed ahead. I mean, the, the United States Navy, to me, as, a, as, a, as an Army guy, um, it, has a, it has a tradition that goes back to the Continental Navy, which was small and had to be ferocious. And so our Navy, traditionally, has been a ferocious, in harm's way Navy. Go get them. And it was frustrating for, for the Blue Water sailors in the Civil War because they didn't have a Confederate Navy to fight. I mean, you have actions you know, a, a, around Hampton Roads, of course, but they're Blue Water, Brown Water. But the Confederates rely on, on privateers. Uh, such as you know the famous Alabama, the Savannah, and it, it, and they're commerce raiders. They're not interested in duking it out, and they finally get cornered by the Kearsarge off uh, Cherbourg. Uh, it proves that you know the Union gunnery is vastly better because Confederates have just been sinking whaling vessels. Um, so it's it, it's a tough war for the Navy in the sense that they don't get the glory that the Army does. It's, it's a ground war, and yet the naval blockade is essential. And Winfield uh, Scott, as opposed to Winfield Scott Hancock, the elder, Winford, Win, Winfield Scott, uh, was mocked at the beginning of the war for the anaconda plan, for the idea that you had to surround the South like an anaconda snake. But that's ultimately what won the war, uh, uh, as far as logistics go. And another thing, another point, though, is the Navy was great at delivering supplies I mean, that doesn't sound very romantic, but they did. I mean, the naval cooperation, Grant comes east. Grant loves working with the Navy. He has no inter-service rivalry. Um, and with the James River fleet, and, the, and the, they, together they, they build a, a logistic city at, civil, uh, at City Point, a hospital that's accordance off about 100 acres. It's, it's amazing. And the, the James River fleet does a very fine job of supporting the Army with you know, naval gunnery, heavy, heavy guns, et cetera. So the cooperation there uh, is just absolutely superb. And naval uh, army cooperation, is, is, it's good in uh, the Spanish-American War. Um, and, you know, it's, and then it kind of, we get this inter-service inter rivalry growing up 
uh, more and more uh, uh, Navy versus Army, Marines versus Army. Then the Air Force comes along and everybody hates the Air Force. Um, if I can, you know, one thing I think we've made progress on, but still have a long way to go on, is the generals and admirals today need to remember it's not about your rank. It's not about working for Lockheed Martin or, or Bath Ironworks after you retire. It's about duty to the country. And sometimes that means the Air Force has to give the Army a little something. Sometimes it means uh, the Army has to give the Navy a little something. I'm really troubled by the, the budget squabbles. Now, that's off subject, I know. But my God, we got to all play on the same team because you know what the bad guys do. Luke. Well, because I portrayed all of them as they were. Some of them were very, very clean spoken men. Religion was a very important part of life for many Civil War leaders. I, and soldiers, but soldiers who'd served on the frontier, whether they wore blue or gray in the Civil War, men who'd served long years, even decades, on the Western frontier and the Seminole Wars, they really didn't speak like um, um, seminary students. <laughs> and so, I, in, the case, in some cases, I actually, I actually try to play the obscenity down a bit because in a case of somebody like Sheridan or, or Early, if, if we went full bore, it really would be offensive. But I'm trying in all these, Luke, I'm trying to be true to history, as true as I can, as accurate. I mean, I want to know what the weather was like, not just on a day, but at a given time of day. And so I'm trying to, as best I can, within the limits of whatever talent I may have, to just give people a more accurate version of how these historical figures were. It takes nothing, you know, soldiers in the heat of battle, um, you know, when they're, they're, they're trying to feel around if they have any more ammunition left and the enemy's coming at them and everybody's screaming and wounded men on all sides, they rarely say, oh my, I believe I've misplaced my bullets. You know, <laughs> it's, so, you know, it's, it can be a bit much for some folks. I understand it because we're, we're conditioned by uh, a heroic version of history to believe that all these men were flawless and noble. They weren't. To me, uh, what's great about them is they overcome their human frailties to lead. And sometimes that human's frailties uh, was vented in profane language. And um, from my own period in service in the Army as an enlisted man, before things became politically correct, I can tell you also that some of the obscenity rose to the level of folk poetry. <laughs> That's the best answer I can give you. Uh, I'm sure everybody, some of you can sing, uh, could stand up and sing Up Jump the Monkey in a Coconut Grove. But <laughs> questions? Or is everybody hungry? Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for braving the weather and coming this evening. <laughs>